Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the meeting to order <clears throat> for Monday, March 20th. Tonight's a special city council meeting. It's our state of the city address. So I want to thank you for joining us in person here in council chambers and also online. Um, what I'd like to do then is ask our city clerk to call the roll. Good evening. Council member Aguirre. Here. Council member Aiken. Here. Council member Howard. Here. Council member Martinez Ceballos. Here. Council member Sturkin. Here. Vice Mayor Espinosa Garnica. Here. And Mayor G. Present. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Councilmember Howard, may I invite you to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Thank you, Council Member Howard. Um, in the post state of emergency world we live in, I have to do this part about AB 2449. We have all council members present, so no one's asking to be excused for either um, emergency or family, so we'll go on. we on to number, item number five, public comment. This is the only opportunity this evening for public comment. The way our public comment works in a hybrid environment, in-person speakers will be called first in the order in which speaker cards are turned in to our city clerk. Speaker cards are located at the back table in the council chambers and must be turned into the city clerk at the dais. After that, virtual attendees who have joined us by Zoom will be called after the in-person comments have been given. If you're attending virtually, feel free to raise your hand on Zoom or press star nine if you've joined by phone. I'll now turn over the public comment section to our city clerk who will facilitate public comment. Pamela. Thank you, Mary G. As mentioned, we will start with our in-person speakers. And I do not have any speaker cards for in-person speakers. I'm looking at our audience just to make sure. All right, thank you. And so we will turn now to our attendees who have joined us by Zoom. If you wish to make public comment this evening, as Mayor G mentioned, this is the only opportunity for public comment. So we ask that you please raise your hand at this time. Keep your hand raised until you're called. And Mayor G, I do not see any raised hands on Zoom. So that concludes public comment. Thank you, Pamela. Appreciate the help on that. But well, before we begin our State of the City, I want to take a moment and we really want to say thank you to our public works staff for their commitment and dedication and for the many hours of regular time and overtime spent responding to fallen trees caused by our windstorms last week. Over the past several months, we have experienced things I've never heard about before, atmospheric rivers causing the ground to be saturated, and then the winds came. And in some places of our country, they call them category one or category two winds, They're like hurricanes, and trees weren't ready. And they um, weren't able to withstand the combination of saturated ground and um, high winds. Our public works staff on the first afternoon, the windstorms worked through the night to the early morning. And I understand from our city manager, our crews worked about 1.30 in the morning, went home and came back and started all over again. That first night or first afternoon, there were about 57 calls for service for fallen trees. About 80% of them were for in the public right of way or public trees. And the next morning, there were another 80 calls for service. You know, our staff focuses on removing trees, number one, that are in the public right of way or a threat to life safety or to our public's, you know, first responders be able to provide. Um, life safety um, services. So again, thank you to our public work staff. And I wanna say thank you to everyone on our city team on behalf of the city council. It wasn't only our public work staff, it was everybody else, our first responders, our city staff, uh, during the power outages, our libraries are open and really full from what I understand, people looking to charge their devices, access Wi-Fi and everything. Um, you know, I don't know how we prepare for all these things all the time, but what I can assure you is that our staff is ready to respond when things happen and they did. So on behalf of the council, I thank Public Works and everybody on staff here in the city for helping keeping our community together and helping us survive the 
the storms that happened last week. So as we move forward, this is a special evening tonight. Again, thank you all for being here in person and thank you for joining us virtually for our state of the city. So panel, if you wanna put up our first slide, we'll get started. Tonight's council meeting is focused on sharing with our community the work that has been done, where we are and where we are going. It's, just, it's really hard to imagine. Here we are March 20th. Just over three years ago, March 17th, 2020, an emerging health order was issued for all of us to stay at home and shelter in place. A lot has changed since then, and the world we are living in today is much different than it was before the health orders issued. Each of us has had to adjust, evolve, and move forward differently. 2022 has not been any different than the preceding year. It remains a year of challenges and change. These changes require us to stay focused on life in our community, yet at the same time, look at diverse ways of providing public services. As we move forward into 2023, we need to reimagine how the city provides services to our residents, businesses, and visitors. We also need to take a close look at how we retain, attract, and develop our staff in a market that is competing for top talent and manage within our financial resources. Redwood City is known as a city that is able to get things done. We take immense pride in community engagement and look for the input from all members of our diverse community. We cherish and celebrate the diversity of Redwood City, seeking to build a better community together. As a leader and innovator, Redwood City is a leader on strategic priorities such as housing, homelessness, transportation, children, and youth. We'll hear more on, these, on the progress of these efforts tonight. Next slide, please, Pamela. As we take a look at the state of the city, one of the biggest differences today is that all council members are now elected by district. Even this has evolved with the first district elections that were held in 2020 that used the 2010 census data to establish districts basically a one and done district election in 2020. For the 2022 elections, the 2020 census data was used. This evolution from at-large elections to district-based elections is new to our community. While we, the council, are now elected by district, we represent all of Redwood City. For the first part of our presentation tonight, I would like, to, I would like you to meet each of our council members and learn a little bit more about who they are. I would like to invite each council member to introduce themselves briefly, share why they ran for council and what they're most excited about in their role here at the dais. Next slide, please. I guess I get things started. Um, for all of you that may not know who I am, I'm Jeff G and honored to serve as mayor. I was elected to council at large in 2009 and 2013. And as the city transitioned to district elections in 2020, I was elected in district one, Redwood Shores. One of the major reasons that I chose to return to council was to work towards greater diversity of representation on the council and our, and our boards and commissions. We have started some of these changes to increase diversity by eliminating some of the requirements on our boards and commissions. We've removed the requirement to be an elector and we lowered the age of serving on some of our boards and commissions to 16. We still have more work to do to ensure that we have geographic diversity on our boards and that we build a pipeline of future candidates for council. Vice Mayor Espinosa Garnica. Thank you, Mayor. Hi, my name is Lisa Espinosa Garnica. Uh, she, they pronouns, I represent District 3. And a few things about me is that I'm a child of Mexican immigrants. I was, I'm first generation here, first generation college student, grew up here in North Brooks and Redwood City. I attended all the public schools here um, and pursued education and, and literature. I've experienced quite a lot in my adolescence here in Redwood City and reasons why I ran include trying to big, bring about perspective that was multifaceted, that was diverse and um, 
I really wanted this focus coming from working class people like myself. I am a, a union member of SCIU 2015 and a caregiver for the county. And I think my motivation to continue on uh, is to make sure that working class people, BIPOC, uh, queer folks like myself are able to run and succeed and represent their populations that are most um, underserved. And so my priorities have been about um, abolitionist beliefs, you know, trying to really address public safety in a way that is sound, evidence-based, and truly transformative, and reckoning with a lot of our historical problems, such as anti, I'm sorry, as, such as imperialism and all the realities of social inequality. <laughs> and so I bring that to this table and try to bring those, that perspective to the housing solutions and, and much more to our transportation and, and our climate action. So I hope to continue to be that voice while I'm on council. And um, those are all the remarks I wanted to share. Thank you very much. And I'd like to pass it to Council Member Aguirre. Thank you, Vice Mayor. <clears throat> My name is Alicia Aguirre and I represent District 7 and have represented at large, um, started in 2005, have been elected numerous times and also finished up uh, my first term to finish uh, assembly member Ira Ruskin's term and that's how I, I started. And the reason I ran is because I was on a lot of community boards, um, seven at the time, including the Mount Carmel School Board, including the Redwood City Elementary School Board, including um, shelter network, a number of boards. And I thought the way that I could really make an impact is, as they say, sit at the table, in this case, sitting at the dais, I felt that I was able to do more that um, globally that I'm really interested in, in working. <clears throat> and some of the things that I think I'm really excited about what we've been able to accomplish in these years that I've been on is a lot of change in Redwood City. And change is hard, but it's good, and it's become we've become a leader in the region, not just in San Mateo County, but in the nine Bay Area counties regarding housing, infrastructure, childcare, making that one of our goals. And knowing that we have a community that backs us up and that brings up these ideas to us and so, says to us, this is what we need and that we are able to work with the community is so important. Otherwise I couldn't say and brag that we are the only third city in the state that has a housing element approved. And I love bragging about it, but it's because our community also needs to brag. This is what they wanted and this is how we are trying to work towards it. I was cleaning out some papers this week and I ran into previous notes of state of the city. State of the city. At one point I was um, the vice mayor for Mayor G and looking at the notes and how we used to do it where there were just two of us and I'm excited now there's all seven of us that can talk to you and tell us um, what we're the most proud of and what are our challenges as we continue forward. And I'd like to pass it on to uh, Council Member Aiken. Thank you, Council Member Aguirre. I'm Kaya Aiken and I was elected last November to serve as your representative for the next four years. I threw my hat into the ring last May because I felt my expertise, experience and values could help Redwood City, a place I've known all my life. I was born in Redwood City, went to high school here and get, got one of my first jobs as an accounts payable clerk and receptionist at the Port of Redwood City when I was in college. Several generous and kind individuals from Redwood City served as mentors and role models to me when I was a young adult. After graduate school, I served as legal counsel to two national corporations while working in downtown San Francisco. My husband and I <clears throat> moved to Redwood City 20 years ago because we felt it had so much to offer us at that time in our lives. Over the many years since then, my appreciation of Redwood City has only grown as I've become more involved and met so many amazing individuals. About 15 years ago, I saw a banner downtown advertising a community class called PACT that would teach me about Redwood City. I signed up. Following that experience, I served on the Historic Resources Advisory Committee for eight years. I was proud to have worked on the historic element of the downtown precise plan, which the city council and I believe many of my colleagues here uh, adopted back in 2011. I'm passionate about serving my community and influencing local policy to illuminate a brighter future. 
Regarding larger jurisdictional issues such as climate pricing, I feel that my background may be helpful. In a few minutes, I will talk about Redwood City's Climate Action Plan, but right now I'd like to pass it over to Council Member uh, Howard. Thank you, Council Member Aiken. I'm Diane Howard. In 1981, my husband Steve and my son Jeffrey and I arrived in Redwood City having moved from New York. We opened a family medical practice shortly after. As a nurse, I was able to manage the office and take care of our patients for over 25 years. We live in the same house we moved into over 40 years ago. Our son, a retired Marine and a nurse, lives with his beautiful wife, also a nurse in Knoxville, Tennessee. I began my journey into public service in 1984, serving on several boards, committees, and commissions before I decided to run for a seat on the city council in 1994. I served four terms and during that time was part of several wonderful councils who envisioned a vibrant downtown and a public gathering plaza with many civic buildings such as City Hall, Red Morton Community Center, a new police and fire department and more. With much hard work and determination, we were able to bring all these projects to fruition. I retired in 2009, but decided to run again in 2013 I realized that there was still so much more to accomplish and wanted to continue planning that vision. In 1997, I was chosen by the governor to sit on the Blue Ribbon Task Force, representing both my city and San Mateo County in planning the future for water transit in the Bay Area. I have never stopped working towards that goal, and I'm so pleased to say we are now just a few years away from launching our first vessel from the port of Redwood City. I also have a passion for increasing our housing stock in all areas of affordability, especially in areas along major transit corridors. I served as your mayor from 2019 through 2021 during COVID, one of the most difficult and challenging periods in our history. Working as a team, our city staff and council worked together to do everything and anything that needed to be done to get us through this difficult time. Most recently, I was elected to represent District 6. However, I will always serve all the people of our wonderful Redwood City community. It continues to be an honor and a privilege to be a member of our City Council, and I'm looking forward to continuing my public service as your representative. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to turn it over to Council Member Martinez Sabias. Thank you, council member, and good evening, everybody. My name is Elmer Martinez Ceballos. I represent District 4 covering the Stambaugh, Heller, and Palm Park neighborhoods. As uh, some of you may know, I'm a lifelong Redwood City resident. I'm a first-generation Latino born to Central American immigrants who came to the United States in the 1980s. My parents set down roots here in Redwood City because this community had so much to offer for a good life. It's wonderful schools, the diverse and welcoming neighbors that made this place feel like home, and the economic opportunities that this city has to offer. And I wouldn't have it any other way. I am so proud to be from Redwood City. I am a product of our local schools. I played soccer at Red Morton and Hoover on the weekends. I tutored students at the Boys and Girls Club and attended Sequoia High School, go Ravens, uh, before becoming the first person in my family to graduate from college. Growing up in these neighborhoods, I know firsthand how these struggles uh, have impacted our residents and what they face on the day to day. What they do to work, study and live in our community. And from an early age, I knew I wanted to serve my neighbors and help lessen those burdens, even if it was in some small way. This passion for public service work led me to the offices of Senator Jerry Hill and Assemblymember Mullen, where I acted as the liaison to the county's 10 northernmost cities. I handled casework that included so many really important issues like housing, healthcare, transportation, and through the COVID pandemic, all of that, and so much unemployment casework. I'm deeply rooted in this community, and I wanted to serve on this city council to play a bigger role in how our city tackles the challenges impacting all of our residents. I want to use my skills and perspective to ensure that everybody has a seat in the table and feels heard. It's an exciting time to serve on the city council with four new members, including myself. The council's adding so much new and different life experiences, skill sets, and ideas into the mix. 
And we're also very lucky to be served by three experienced, and I would even say battle-hardened colleagues mm -hmm. here and city staff who have stewarded the city through the COVID-19 pandemic and all the lingering effects that we're still experiencing now. So I think this new dynamic is gonna help us widen the lens in which we approach all of our, these challenges in the years ahead. And I hope it'll help us continue to keep our community a vibrant and innovative leader in the Bay Area. So thank you everybody. And I'll pass it over to Council Member Sturkin who picked a, a great color scheme tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Martinez Ceballos. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Turkin. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm proud to represent District 2. That's Bear Island, uh, Centennial, downtown, and part of Mount Carmel. And I ran for a safe, livable, and affordable Redwood City for everyone. I ran to get more housing built in Redwood City at all income levels, to get people off the streets into permanent housing, and to keep our neighborhoods safe including downtown, making sure it's safe, vibrant. I grew up here on a peninsula in Belmont and found my way to Redwood City um, back in 2018 or so. I went to Carmont High School, um, got some rivals over here, go Scots. <laughs> and I uh, went to SF State, got my degree in environmental studies, then served in AmeriCorps for the city of Hayward, uh, working on their greenhouse gas emissions inventory. And following that, I have had a career in the nonprofit sector, in conservation and housing nonprofits like Green Foothills and currently Hip Housing. And so uh, after that, I joined the Transportation Advisory Committee here in Redwood City, Planning Commission, and now I'm on council. And my passion is really to uh, keep our community housed. Um, I just want to acknowledge that in my first 90 days, I didn't expect we'd see multiple atmospheric storms, rivers, uh, flooding in my neighborhood and multiple power outages. But what I did expect was exemplary leadership on the part of my colleagues on the council and hard work by our city staff. And finally, uh, resiliency by our community, just looking no much farther than my own district with whether it be neighbors helping neighbors on G Street or RBC Mobile Home Park. So it's very much a privilege to serve you. And with this, I will pass it over to our mayor, G. Thank you colleagues for sharing a little bit about you. And I hope everyone who's tuned in and are here tonight learned a little bit more about your council members that are representing Redwood City. So again, thank you colleagues for sharing. <clears throat> I'd now like to start a program up of the city's work on the council's strategic priorities. The Council's strategic priorities serves as a guide to how we focus city resources. We'll begin this evening with the Vice Mayor Espinosa Garnica and Council Member Aguirre sharing about the city's efforts on our housing and homelessness initiatives. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Redwood City community members consistently identify housing and homelessness as a top concern. Redwood City is a community that values safe, affordable housing for people at all income levels. However, for many families, affordable housing is not accessible. In a citywide effort to meet our unique community housing needs for people at all income levels, the city has prioritized four housing goals, known as the four Ps. Preserve existing affordable housing. Protect housing options for low and middle income residents. Produce housing to meet to meeting regional housing needs allocation, ARENA goals, for moderate, low, and very low income residents, and partner on housing opportunities for unique populations. With Project Home Key, San Mateo County recently purchased three hotels in Redwood City to convert them into permanent affordable senior housing, emergency shelter, and permanent extremely low income affordable housing. In total, over $100 million has come to projects in Redwood City from home key funds, and there have been 257 units slash hotel rooms in Redwood City that have been converted into affordable housing since 2020. In addition, we continue to monitor our existing below market rate housing portfolio, which is over 900 units. We also offer community development block grant CDBG funded minor home repair program. To address the city's first two housing goals, preserve and protect, the city developed an anti-displacement strategy to serve as a policy roadmap for how we can achieve these goals. While displacement is a complex issue, 
Redwood City has taken a leadership role in being thoughtful about how its policies and funding priorities can help reduce displacement of Redwood City residents in both the short and long term. We know that Redwood City continues to face an affordable housing crisis, which especially affects low income earners as Black, Indigenous, and people of color residents throughout the city. After two years of listening to residents, property owners, local and regional housing experts, and conducting extensive research, policy recommendations in the anti-displacement strategy were developed with the goal to preserve affordable housing and protect housing options for our low and moderate income residents. The anti-displacement strategy includes specific recommendations per for preserving existing unsubsidized affordable housing and mobile home parks in our community, as well as improving the city's existing tenant protection policies that require landlords to provide relocation assistance in certain situations and minimum lease terms. Stay tuned for a city council study session later this summer on the potential anti-harassment and right to return policies. Since 2020, over 280 extremely low income units have been created or proposed, which more than doubles the number of extremely low units in Redwood City. Other efforts to incentivize ELI units um, include prioritize ELI units for city funding, explore ELI incentives, update of the affordable housing ordinance. Housing became even more important with the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the biggest securities people could have could have during such a deep level of crisis was a roof over their heads. To support the city's most vulnerable renters, the city council took action in March 2020 to fund a COVID-19 emergency rental assistance fund. The program is managed by the Fair Oaks Community Center to help households, including child care providers who experienced a loss of income due to COVID-19 and had no alternative source of income, such as paid leave or unemployment insurance. Over $4.3 million in Redwood City's COVID-19 Emergency Rental Assistance Program, over 1,300 unduplicated households served. Last summer, Redwood City also provided one-time utility relief, uh, sorry, utility bill relief. The City Council approved the use of $1.5 million to assist our utility customers struggling to pay pandemic-related debt. To help prevent customers in need from facing penalties or shutoffs, the city directed most funds to utility accounts 90 days or more in arrears as of June 15, 2022. One time, credit has, one time credits also given to customers who were current on their payments and were enrolled in the city's water and sewer rate assistance program. Additional rental and utility bill assistance continues to be available on a case by case basis throughout the Fair Oaks, through the Fair Oaks Community Center. Over 734 affordable units have been completed, are under construction or approved since 2021. Over 900 affordable housing units proposed. On February 13, 2023, the City Council unanimously approved the housing element, safety element, and environmental justice policies. With this approval, Redwood City became the first San Mateo County jurisdiction to have an approved six cycle housing element that meets the state's guidelines. But the work doesn't stop there. The next step is to implement the many important programs outlined in the housing element that will help us achieve our goal of creating equitable housing for everyone in our community. The housing element sets specific timelines for program implementation that begin this year and extend throughout the next eight years. Redwood City staff is fully committed to meeting our housing element obligations. Our first implementation item will be zoning and municipal codes updates. And we look forward to sharing our progress with the community in the coming months. I'm now going to turn it over to Council Member Aguirre to speak to some of our homeless initiatives underway. Thank you, Vice Mayor. <clears throat> so I know this, there's a lot of data coming at you, so I want you to listen carefully because we're going to have a test at the end of the um, state of the season. It's That's right, it's midterms. So how do we get to the homeless initiatives and what are the, what's the process? So we have a countywide homeless service system for preventing homelessness, addressing and ensuring permanent housing opportunities. And when we develop these housing initiatives, the work plan, which builds on the countywide system. So we couldn't do what we're doing without all the partnerships that are happening within our county. We implemented the San Mateo County's vision of functional zero. Homelessness in Redwood City, functional zero means that every 
individual experience homelessness in San Mateo County who chooses assistance can be sheltered in emergency shelter or a permanent or temporary shelter. We want to mitigate the public health, public safety, environmental concerns related to unsheltered homelessness and homeless encampments in Redwood City. We want to transition unsheltered residents in Redwood City into permanent housing. I think that's the number one goal that we all see in the state, not just in Redwood City. And we want to make sure that we eliminate the impacts and street homelessness in our city, the types of impacts that we've seen and that we've all we have a compassion for and we want to make sure that there's safety. <clears throat> As part of our um, developing these in innovative solutions, the city continues actively engage with the county on its partnerships for emergency permanent affordable housing. The, over 300 emergency shelter beds have been added in Redwood City since 2020. And think of what that means. And, and when you look at the numbers of the unsheltered, unhoused, that we have in Redwood City. This is a huge, huge number that we've been able to work with. This includes a navigation center scheduled to complete later this month, which will provide 240 units of non-congregation emergency shelter for single home adults and homeless adult couples. The navigation center will replace the existing Maple Street shelter. And it is modeled, uh, the, the center model provides individual short-term housing while also offering a range of intensive safety net services on site. So the, I think that when we think about housing, it's not just giving folks a home, but giving them the other things that they need in order to, to make sure that they have the tools to not have to come back and be on the streets. As part of this project negotiation, five shelter hold units will be available to immediately provide emergency housing for residents experiences homelessness in Redwood City. And as we look to our numbers, the great news I want, I'd love to share is that we have decreased by 23% of the number of unsheltered homelessness. And remember Redwood City has the highest number um, in the county based on um, we were located, you know, I guess it's our weather. It's a lot of other great things, but to be able to have this number go down, I think says a lot with our initiatives and, and the projects that we need to move forward on. This is getting us closer to what we said earlier about functional zero homelessness in Redwood City. And some of the ways that we're doing some of the mitigation efforts are um, that while we can't solve all of this alone, we're investing heavily in implementing strategies and partnerships with property owners, including the state, service providers, the county, and the host of nonprofit agencies. I can't tell you how important that's, this has been, especially during the storms and all the things that we've been living in the last few months, including COVID in the last few years. Additionally, representatives from the City, County of San Mateo, State Senate Assembly, and California Highway Patrol meet by monthly under the resolving encampment through effective engagement in the pilot program. Because of the significant number of fires affecting both these encampments in the surrounding neighborhoods, the city has worked closely with Caltrans since March 2022 to address safety issues at encampments at the Caltrans right away. And some folks that live in the city say, wait, this is happening in our neighborhood. And, and many times it's not necessarily there. It is in the right of way of Caltrans and it's very challenging for the city and the staff to make changes unless we work with the state and the importance of our partnerships. Increased outreach has helped to build the relationships and we are seeing some willingness to accept shelter, which is also a challenge, which we expect to increase with the opening of the navigation center. One of the things that we implemented in October 2020 is the largest temporary RV safe parking program in the county of San Mateo, and it was aimed to minimize public health concerns while helping unsheltered RV residents transition into permanent housing. The purpose of the program was to transition a majority of the RVs off the city streets into a parking lot where those residents could safely park and work on a path to permanent housing. As of February 2023, the original 91 households that joined the program, 55 or 60% of households have now moved into permanent housing. 12 households chose to go to shelter or to other options elsewhere. 
Other households opted to continue, discontinue participating in the safe parking program. So it was effective. It did reach all the folks. Although there are many touching stories of residents that have transitioned out of safe parking program into permanent housing, one that touched our hearts in Redwood City is the story of Octavio and his 87-year-old disabled mother, Raimunda. Octavio and Raimunda had been homeless for the past five years with the last two years residing in a very small RV park at the RV safe parking lot in Redwood City. Shortly after Octavio moved there, his disabled mother had no choice but to move in with him. The family then got matched to Casa de Esperanza and gave Octavio hope that there is a light at the end of what was then a dark tunnel. Coming to Casa Esperanza has given Octavio motivation, support from the team and motivation that he needs to be able to maintain his sobriety and look for work to be able to support himself and his mother. He is extremely grateful for the opportunity to reside at Casa Esperanza and cannot wait to start working. At this time, I'd like to pass this over to Council Member Sturk and to speak about some of our transportation initiatives that are underway. Thank you, Council Member Aguirre. It's my pleasure to give an overview of our transportation goals, uh, including to create and maintain a multimodal, safe, and accessible transportation network for everyone. So our first goal is bicycle pedestrian safety and Vision Zero. And that includes creating an action plan to implement Vision Zero <laughs> strategies that will result in no deaths in and no serious injuries involving vehicles and other traffic. Sustainability is our second goal, resulting in zero emission trips. That's by creating policies and infrastructure to support Vision Zero and uh, zero emission trips. And finally, uh, regional mobility to ensure that Redwood City is considered in all strategic regional transportation initiatives. Think high-speed rail, Caltrain electrification, Dumbarton Rail, potentially, and more. Secondly, uh, bicycle pedestrian safety. The Redwood City Walk, Bike, Thrive initiative developed two plans for Redwood City, a citywide bicycle uh, and pedestrian master plan and the Vision Zero Action Plan. These plans recommend specific projects to improve traffic safety around Redwood City and make walking and biking in our city safer, easier, and more popular. On June 27, 2022, the City Council unanimously voted to approve and adopt the Redwood City Walk, Bike, Thrive Plan. And that plan outlines and prioritizes many proposed projects, including a citywide bicycle network, improving walking, biking, and traffic safety conditions across the city and the transit district. Transit district plans for shopping, jobs, housing, and a new transit center for trains and buses in the heart of downtown, making River City a hub. The redevelopment of the transit district is a once in a lifetime opportunity for us to rebuild this train station, making space for more frequent and reliable train service, a four track uh, station, a bus depot, station amenities, and new housing and jobs will be created here along a new activated open space plaza, neighborhood uh, shopping, and improved routes for bicycles and pedestrians. The transit district will also greatly improve bicycle and pedestrian safety, comfort, and convenience through infrastructural improvements and traffic calming measures. On November 28, 2022, the City Council considered and approved the Transit District Amendments and Supplemental Environmental Impact Report. And those approved amendments to the general plan, the Downtown Precise Plan, and Associated Environmental Review of the Transit District include the following. That's land redevelopment of the Transit Center and Sequoia Station properties, additional space for a four-track station, a circulation improvement associated with potential grade separations to ensure adequate vehicular, bicycle, and pedestrian connections, and hopefully the potential for a car-free Franklin Street extension. And now with the 101-84 uh, interchange project. Redwood City, in cooperation with the California Department of uh, Transportation, or Caltrans, and the San Mateo County Transportation Authority, is leading the effort to reconstruct 10184. I know many of you are excited about this, given the bottleneck that's over there. 
So this project will modify the interchange on and off ramps and adjacent local intersections with new traffic controls mm -hmm. and build a bicycle and pedestrian facilities to improve access to the Port of Urban City, to the planned ferry terminal and connect uh, friendly acres with downtown. And the benefits include regional mobility, improving freeway connections, reducing congestion, greater trade, mm -hmm. improving access to the Port of Redwood City and Seaport Center, reducing bottlenecks that routinely delay in all you know, freight activity, and improve safety, increasing vehicular, bicycle, and pedestrian safety with dedicated spaces and signalized intersections. And finally, greater equity, connecting equity priority communities with housing, jobs, and recreation. And now grade separations. So Redwood City has six at-grade railroad crossings where the trains meet the tracks uh, and the tracks meet the road. Increased train service, you know, generally will mean longer wait times when you're waiting to cross the tracks and the train is crossing. To increase safety and improve circulation in the city due to rail activity and to allow for increased train service, we're going to have to consider additional grade separations. And these separations must be planned carefully to balance the needs of the community and to maximize traffic flow and safety. And last summer, we sought community feedback at the southernmost crossings, including Maple, Main, and Chestnut Streets, with the help of outreach from Nuestra Casa to conduct a bilingual survey, which conducted nearly, or received rather, nearly 500 respondents, responses. And overall, respondents were supported fully grade separating chestnut from all modes of transportation and grade separating all six crossings at the same time. So now I'm excited to turn it over to council member Martina Ceballos to tell us about our priority of children and youth. Thank you member, council member Sturkin and thank you everyone again for tuning in tonight. I'm pleased to share a brief overview of the city council's children and youth priority to create opportunities for children and youth to grow, learn, and play in safe and healthy environments. The goals include, excuse me, sorry, next slide, sorry, Pam. Um, the goals include production to increase the number and affordability of childcare spaces, amenities and programs, increasing opportunities for family entertainment, family-friendly businesses and youth activities, and youth engagement increasing opportunities for our youth to feel heard, develop leadership skills, and provide meaningful input. And our first slide is the Purposeful Action Creation and Engagement Program, or PACE. Last year, the City Council approved the creation of the PACE program for transition age youth 12 to 24 years old. The PACE program was developed in partnership with the great leaders at Redwood City Together and the Redwood City Police Activities League. The program was created in response to community concerns about instances of disruptive youth behavior in downtown Redwood City. And it's a community-based initiative that aims to counteract that with positive relationships between our community leaders, Redwood City police officers, and the bike life movement youth in Redwood City and in North Fair Oaks. The PACE team has made great strides to support our youngest residents since its inception last summer, and we're already seeing some promising results from this approach. The PACE program has created jobs, provided weeknight and weekend activities for youth, and launched youth and community-based organization advisory spaces. This is also very cool. Several youth from the youth biking movement have also received jobs with us here at City Hall through the REACH After School Program. The Parks and Rec Initiative has been in Redwood City Schools for the last 20 years, and programming revolves around the acronym Recreation, Enrichment, Academic Intervention, Community Service, and Health and Wellness. Youth from the Bike Life Movement has also have also secured jobs with our partner community-based orgs, Redwood City PAL and Redwood City Together, so we're sharing. On children activities, our great library director, Derek Wolfgram, and his wonderful staff continue their efforts to provide library events and activities for kids and teens to support 
Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Mathematics, or STEAM education, in the new makerspace. They're delivering also at least 10 story times per week, including regular bilingual sessions across all three library locations, and have increased youth recreation activities in North Fair Oaks and Redwood Shores. On youth activities, to counteract the lingering impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, each of our libraries is offering programming on recovery issues like learning loss, mental health, and food insecurity. Our city libraries offer important opportunities for the youth to express themselves and weigh in on important issues and projects. And that's looked like our RCPL Listens series, which is a community engagement session to develop new library service priorities for 2023 and beyond. I actually had an opportunity to attend a session in the fall and highly recommend folks attend. It gives you a really greater appreciation for all the work that the library does aside from let you rent out a book. So definitely check that out. Um, it also has included uh, different capacities like the teen and youth advisory boards that are active and I believe recruiting for new students to join. So share that with the young folks in your life and new public sector career speed networking events to be held later this spring. So keep an eye out if that is something of interest. But we're seeing a demand in the community for these programs um, with around 9,347 children and teens participating in the 2022 Summer Learning Challenge. So lots of, lots of our young residents taking advantage of these resources. On park renovations, this might be easily the best slide of the night. Um, Lots of exciting work being done all around town. Uh, just down the road from us here at City Hall, Jardín de Niños is expanding. Final construction drawings have been completed and construction bid documents are in the process of being completed. So ex we're expecting to award the project by this summer, summer 2023. So our future uh, neighborhood night outs at Jardín might look a little different in the next year or two. At Dolphin Park, our Redwood Shores neighbors might notice a few new things in store, uh, a new playground, pathways and surfing improvements have been discussed, and a, a new improved seating and picnic area is also in store. Um, neighbors will notice that uh, starting to take place very soon. Work is beginning on the playground uh, right before the summertime, so just in time for schools to get out. The project is expected to take only 90 days from the start of construction, that is assuming the weather cooperates. And I know lots of folks have been hearing about the downtown library park. Um, the city has been planning this project as a part of the approved downtown parks feasibility study that identified several city owned parcels as future open space to serve the downtown area and its neighbors. The design team has been collecting community input to guide the park development for several months now. Over 1,100 survey responses were received on topics such as park character, formation, and preferred amenities and features. And after the last community meeting in January 2023, the consultant team is in the process of developing the final preferred plan for a final community meeting to be held before May 2023. So coming up really soon. And then last park update here. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, Hoover Park and the pool renovation projects. We launched a community engagement process that includes community wide surveys and stakeholder meetings. That included the Hoover School, the Boys and Girls Club, three neighborhood associations, and nearby child care centers. The vision includes an improved playground, a spray ground, which is a, a water wreck area, a teaching pool, improved parking circulation, lighting, walkways, accessibility, a dog park, a volleyball court, fitness areas, picnic areas, and more. Don't know what's left, but <laughs> preferred plans will be developed and then a final design which should be released later this year. Pickleball, pickleball. Pickleball, there you go. <laughs> and uh, some exciting news on our BCCs. The City Council recently adopted an ordinance expanding member eligibility criteria for a majority of the city's BCCs, enabling more of our community to serve, including our youth as young as 16 years old, and our community members who are not voter eligible. The 2023 recruitment is now open through April 30th and positions are available on the Architectural Advisory Committee, the Historic Resource, Resources Advisory Committee, the Police Advisory Committee and the Transportation Advisory Committee. 
Interested folks can visit www.redwoodcity.org dash BCC recruitment for more info. And feel free to use the council who have served on our BCCs as resources for that too. And we've arrived at my last slide. Uh, you might have seen these folks in action around town in recent weeks. The great volunteers of our Pride and Beautification Committee are hard at work. The committee promotes the quality of life in Redwood City by creating, participating, and supporting activities and programs that improve the physical aesthetic of our environments. The committee was formed 36 years ago now, in 1987. Since then, our community members have been invited to show pride in their home, Redwood City, in a variety of ways, including acting as advocates for the environment, educating the community about how to protect our natural areas, and advocating for a high standard of community cleanliness, maintenance, and attractiveness. And they're always looking for new volunteers. So the annual spring cleanup is just around the corner in honor of Earth Day. And last year, volunteers collected over three tons of trash and debris. So I think we can beat that with all the, the storm and debris getting brought back up. So uh, let's take out the trash and, and sign up. But that is uh, all I've got. Thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. And at this time, I'd like to pass it over to Council Member Aiken. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member <clears throat> Martina Ceballos. Redwood City's current climate action plan was, was approved in November of 2020, following several, several years of outreach and included 87 written recommendations from the community and multiple meetings and study sessions. It continues Redwood City's proud tradition of exceeding state and national goals, and it is a testament to the strong community engagement that we have always enjoyed in Redwood City. Right now, I'm just gonna briefly highlight some exciting opportunities it contains. As we grow, we are integrating parts of the city's climate action plan with new capital projects and city operations to create a more sustainable future. Some examples, including the following. Redwood City uses 100% renewable wind and solar power to run all of its city facilities. I think that's something to celebrate. We have joined many other local jurisdictions in adopting building codes that we call REACH codes that go above and beyond state standards and encourage and require all electric or all electric readiness for new buildings. Through our downtown precise plan, our general plan and other zoning updates, Redwood City has for several decades prioritized transit oriented development which disincentivizes single occupancy car trips and as a result lowers uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Our plan, this is really exciting. Some people who are listening um, may gain a business advantage here. Our plan in includes incentives. You can save money while supporting our sustainability goals. You can take advantage of over, over 30 different conservation and clean electrical programs. Here are just a few examples. If you buy a heat pump water heater, you can get up, you can get over $4,500 in rebates, $500 from Redwood City, $3,000 from Peninsula Clean Energy, and $1,000 from Bay Ren, which is a part of the Association of Bay Area Governments. And I don't know if people know, but the state of California has banned new purchases of gas powered leaf blowers effective on January 1st of 2024. But Redwood City is here to help. We will give you anywhere from $250 or to $500 cash back free in your hand if you buy an electric leaf blower or electric lawn equipment. Given that gas-powered leaf blowers do not have catalytic converters the way cars do, this is a great opportunity to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And um, part of the Climate Action Plan has been to um, reach out to students in our schools. And one of our fabulous programs, one of many, is called the Climate Resilience Video Contest. Last year's winners were amazing. 
First place went to Caitlin Wang from Clifford Elementary School. She created a video that taught us about reusing cosmetic packaging to reduce plastics in our oceans. Second place was no less amazing. Katie Latora and Tasha Tam from Clifford Elementary School directed a video showing how switching to clean energy sources helps the planet. And last, but by no means least, third place, Gabriella Semke, also from Clifford Elementary School, if you're noticing a theme, shot a video that taught us about how different sunscreens can affect our, our reefs in our oceans. Imagine that. Check them out on our city's website and, and look out for next year's, uh, all of next year's contestants who we will be celebrating over the summer. In January of 2020, the California Assembly created the San Mateo County Flood and Sea Level Rise Resiliency District. It's called One Shoreline. Redwood City is a member along with all 20 San Mateo County cities. Its mission is to address sea level rise, flooding, coastal erosion, and region, regional stormwater infrastructure. It updated and replaced an old 1959 law. Redwood City has partnered with One Shoreline to coordinate and implement flood and sea level rise mitigation projects in Redwood City. This includes work on the many levees in Redwood City that are at ever greater risk due to sea level rise. For example, Redwood City and One Shoreline are collaborating on a sea level rise vulnerability assessment, building on prior regional studies to develop recommended action. And, you know, as we've learned with all these recent storms and uh, situations, we need to recognize that claim, climate change is affecting all of us. And while we may not be able to control when or how we are affected, we still can prepare for emergencies. Studies have shown that being prepared can reduce the fear and anxiety surrounding losses that accompany disasters. Redwood City is in the process of updating our emergency operations plan with many new changes, one of which will be providing information in multiple languages. We encourage everyone in Redwood City to participate in our CERT program. And um, I'm not gonna tell you what that acronym means. I'll just tell you what it is. It's, uh, it's, it's a class, seven classes that educate you about disaster preparedness. You get training and it's free and you get training in such things as fire safety, search and rescue, team organization, and many other topics. Our next uh, CERT Academy, starts on March 30th and goes through mid-May. So please check it out. Um, maybe it'll help you uh, feel more prepared for um, inevitable disruptions like we've had so far. And you can just go to redwoodcity.org slash C-E-R-T. Now, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Council Member Howard, to speak about ways that we can reimagine city services. Thank you, Council Member Aiken. I'm now pleased to share an update on key initiatives underway to reimagine our city services. While we approach 2022 as a year of transition, we are not returning to business as usual. As we focus on restoration and revision of services, we also remain committed to reimagining how we provide those services to adapt to new and different community needs and prepare for a changing future. As a refresher, Redwood City's COVID-19 pandemic recovery strategy is framed as the three R's, to respond to immediate community needs, to restore community cultural, economic, and social vitality, <clears throat> and to reimagine public services in light of evolving community needs and financial resources. Our reimagining work includes reimagining our community services and city resources. We are reimagining service delivery by studying service levels against accepted performance standards, leveraging technology, and applying an equity lens. This effort will begin with public safety departments as they comprise 56% of the general fund budget. 
We are working with outside experts on these topics. The city council will receive reports on service level studies for the police and fire departments in April and May this year. And these studies will inform our service delivery in fiscal year 23 and 24 and beyond. Mental health crisis support. Redwood City is one of four cities working with San Mateo County on a pilot program which deploys licensed mental health clinicians with police officers responding to mental health crisis calls, which launched in December of 2021. We have seen very positive impacts for this program and our assigned clinician is making uh, connections with residents with mental health challenges before they reach a crisis. She also conducts proactive outreach to those living in encampments in an effort to promote the availability of our supportive services. We look forward to hearing recommendations from Stanford University's Gardner Center, complete with their analysis of this two-year pilot program. Our Redwood City Public Library, they listen. As a matter of fact, they have a program Redwood City Public Library Listens. In partnership with a wide range of community organizations last fall, we held community listening sessions to shape the library service priorities. In addition to open listening sessions, we sought to understand unique needs within our community, including those who are experiencing homelessness, who have disabilities, who identify as LGBTQ+, and those who identify as Black, Indigenous, and people of color. The results will shape our service priorities for the next five years. Stay tuned for the results of this engagement effort. The one way the city has brought its value for prioritizing community voice into action is through the 2022 People's Budget. The People's Budget Pilot was a $1 million participatory budgeting experiment. The city conducted six months of community engagement, collected project ideas from 474 community members, and involved 1,759 community members in voting on how to spend a million dollars to improve our community. We are now implementing the winning projects. Funding from the people's budget made it possible to bring dignity on wheels. The mobile shower and laundry service back to the Fair Oaks Community Center in July 2022 on Monday and Wednesday afternoons. So far, the program has served 187 unduplicated individuals at the Fair Oaks Community Center site offering 503 free showers and 236 laundry services. We added funds to the city's housing team budget. So far, $100,000 from the people's budget has been dedicated to support the housing division in implementation of the anti-displacement strategy. El Centro de Libertad has been selected as the vendor for the 10-week youth peer mentorship program designed to help address the substance abuse crisis by providing education, and mentorship to middle school students in our local schools. Finally, we have been working with Caltrans on the design of bike lanes on three blocks of El Camino between Maple Street and Wilson, as well as purchasing a mini street sweeper. We are continuing our implementation of our equity plan. As we strive to make equity the foundational guiding principle in our services and policies, we are making good progress on our 2021 equity plan, which includes equity projects in each department. Staff reports regarding significant policy matters now require equity impact statements. These statements support city council and public conversation about equity by encouraging consideration of equitable outcomes from the planning or goal setting stage of each city project decision or policy. As one part of considering everyone always, the city established an administrative policy last year to commit to recognizing a variety of cultural events and awareness months, awareness months each year. 
This policy helps us ensure we are regularly reviewing cultural events across our community and at a minimum acknowledging specific cultural occasions with an event, learning opportunity, proclamation, or other acknowledgement. Each department has updated its equity commitment for 2023, which will include within, we will include within the 2023-24 budget. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to Mayor G, who will speak about reimagining city resources and to close out this year's State of the City presentation. Thank you, Council Member Howard, and thank you all again for hanging in here. Um, we're getting close to wrapping things up, but as you've heard, in the earlier remarks and through different council member presentations, where we are today in 2023 is very different than where we were three years ago. We have to use the right resources and manage our resources carefully. And the hard news is that during the pandemic, cities, our city has lost $82 million in revenues. This is a big deal when our annual operating budget is $165 million. Our crystal ball about the future revenues are maybe hazy at best. We're expecting a slower economic recovery due to layoffs in the traditional tech sector. Sales tax revenues have surprisingly been high during the pandemic, but with inflation and the higher cost of borrowing, sales tax revenues are probably gonna slow down. What this means is that we'll have to take a look at new revenue streams. In August of last year, the Finance and Audit Committee received a staff briefing on plans to review city fees charged to ensure 100% cost recovery and to look at potential new or expanded sources of revenue. The plan right now is for the council to come back in November to receive an additional update. Next slide, please. Well, all the efforts have in common is that they focus on evolving and innovating how we meet community needs as a city. It also requires work across multiple departments. In many cases, we're stepping outside of traditional ways the city has provided services to, to meet communities' needs. It reminds me of a saying that one of my former CEOs said at a company meeting. I have to say this really carefully so I can get it right. He said, shift happens. So shift did happen, and we need to look at how we provide city services in new ways. Our city, Redwood City, is known as a city that is a leader, an innovator, and is able to get things done. And we will continue to work the work that was started with even more work ahead. There'll be many opportunities for community engagement. So please stay connected with us by signing up for our e-newsletters, follow Redwood City on social media, participate in council meetings, join us at community events, and most importantly, as council member Martina Sabaj shared, apply to serve on a board, committee, or commission. See, this is, um, lastly, I wanna take a moment, and, and Council Member Gage, this is the time where we hand out the, the test. No? Okay. Um, I wanna take a moment to say thank you and recognize Jennifer Yamaguma, our communications manager, who for her work and contributions to our State of the City Address. I also wanted to thank all of our city staff and our past councils and mayors for their work, because what you've seen tonight and heard, we were only only sworn in four months ago as a council. This work was started not in 2023, not only in 2022, not only in 21, but it's that sustained focus and commitment by, by mayors and councils to take care of our community. And that is what we were able to share with everyone tonight. The other caveat is there was a lot of information shared tonight. We're not going to test everyone on it, but I will promise one thing for next year. We're going to have a lot more fun. So I know Chris, Beth, and Derek Wolfgram are here. So I expect a city staff flash mob in front of City Hall next year. And council, you better get ready for a line dance or something that we'll show on video. I'll think of something. We have a year to get ready. Okay. But what you'll see and what you've heard tonight are the council's strategic initiatives and priorities and the work that's being done. And throughout this year, you will see on our agenda a number of different things aligned with achieving and furthering those goals and priorities. 
whether it be rezoning, contracts, grants, whatever they may be, they are fully in alignment with the council's strategic priorities. So I wanna thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for staying engaged. Thank you for listening and participating. I wanna thank our staff again for all the hard work. I thank council for helping present this year's State of the City. We are going to be adjourned shortly, but everyone in the meantime, be safe, be well out there. Again, thank you for being here. Meeting adjourned.